Hello, I'm Anne Marie. And I'm David Thornton. We're from James Creek Cider House. In Cameron, North Carolina, in the land of the pines. And you're listening to, to Cider, Cider Chat. Chat. Episode 179. Hello, and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Rhea Wincaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. This week, we're featuring a cider dinner and chat with Anne-Marie Thornton and David Thornton of James Creek Cider House, based in North Carolina. There's going to be more on that coming right up. But first, a bit of news out and about in Ciderville. We like cider. We like palms. We like orchards. Having some fun. Hello, Ciderville. Welcome back. We are on episode 179. Uh, before I even said that, I had to look back and say, is it 177, 178, uh, 179? Ooh, next episode will be 180. That is just uh, loopy doing me a little bit, a uh, little bit of amazing thing in the world of podcasting. And I'm just really thanking all of you who are taking the time to listen. If you're new to this podcast, do know that I'm going to chit chat a little bit. And then about 10 minutes in or so, sometimes a little bit longer, you'll be hearing the main feature, which is a doozy. I can't wait to share that with you. But when I return, an email in from Russia on Cider. <music> Patreon is a website that helps content creators like myself keep on producing this podcast. And at episode, uh, well, next week will be 180. You know I could use the support. So I was really psyched when I saw two new signups onto Patreon. Uh, you can become a patron too. Just Google Cider Chat Patreon, spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N, or go to ciderchat.com and you'll find a link. This particular email and this particular person is unique in that he is from Russia. And I'm really stoked here to share the email that he sent. So I'm going to dig right into it. He writes, that is a pleasure for me to help your efforts and support it. Tons of really interesting interviews and information. It is like a suddenly found treasure, <laughs> which I adore. Uh, by the way, this gentleman's name is Maxim. And I think, Maxim, that is kind of not unusual. Uh, that's why I really count on listeners telling other people about Cider Chat, because so many people don't realize that, heck, there's a zillion wine podcasts, a zillion beer podcasts. But really, at this point, there's only one weekly Cider po podcast in the world, and it happens to be Cider Chat. And I'm so privileged to be able to do this and uh, happy that you found it. He continues on with, you are right defining Russia as my motherland with a little smiley face uh, because I figured that out via his email. And he says, here we have a cider market rapidly growing. There's commercial manufacturers setting up business. And at the moment, we have not more than five companies who make their cider from fresh juice at 50 to 200 tons scale. Ooh, that's a lot of cider there. A lot of others who make huge amounts of alcoholic drinks based on cider juice concentrate, which, you know, is kind of a different, different beast, isn't it? We, all have, we also have about 20 to 30 garage style makers spread all over the country, producing 500 to 15,000 liters per year without any legalization. And each year newcomers appear. Everybody knows more or less each other. So everything is in a very new beginning now. So that's kind of interesting about Russia because, you know, just that point, I'm thinking, wow, all these different apple varieties. So let's get into that. And what Maxim writes is about him personally, uh, his first batch of cider he made in 2013 without huge success. 
but I'm so glad that you stuck in with it, Maxim. He then writes, I started to learn from Andrew Lee's book, How to Do That Properly. And uh, if you don't know Andrew Lee, that's spelled Lee, L-E-A. Uh, there's a link on the resource page at ciderchat.com for that book if you're interested. And then I have been falling down into the deep hole of cider since then. Another smiley face. I think because of my professional IT and system analysis background mixed with music and woodwork hobbies, I found the cider world so huge in its diversity of fields of specific knowledge and skills. And it really fits my interests as a tight mixture of art, engineering, science, and handcraft. Uh, He continues on. Soon I understood that besides proper fermentation techniques, I need proper tannic cider apples to make good cider. And we have nothing like this in Russia. We just do not have a cider drinking culture. So there is no demand from the market. And this is why growers know nothing about cider apples and methods of growing cheap but good quality technical apples. So I started to learn orcharding, cider varieties, methods of the propagation and cultivation. We have a harsh climate here in the Moscow region with temperatures spread to minus 30 to plus 36, which and that's in Celsius, which translates to Fahrenheit as, well, minus 39 would be minus 38 degrees Fahrenheit and plus 36 degrees Celsius would be 96 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is a huge stretch of uh, temperature range. And Maxim continues with, I had to find really cold resistant varieties, no doubt. I found that there is no worldwide catalog of cider varieties with their, pro- with their properties, so I started to make my own. I gathered information from about 190 varieties and chose 60 of them as and picked 30 of them as worth trying to plant and see if they could live here. After that, it was like a James Bond movie getting scions in from England. And I'm going to kind of keep out this piece here because uh, it is kind of James Bondy, and um, just to keep Maxim safe in that way. Anyways, he writes that finally I grafted and planted my first seedlings in the spring of 2017. In 2016, I had quit my IT job to focus more on cider projects. So you are full in on this. He took a course with Peter Mitchell in England, visited a lot of cideries at the time. He made his first hydraulic wreck and cloth press, prepared a small shed to be an experimental cidery, and tried bigger batches, experimenting with different yeast strains, commercially available dessert apple varieties, and fermentation techniques. And this is a key piece that I think is important for all of us to hear. He writes, now I understand that tannic apples are very desired, but not necessary to make a good cider. Uh, It's kind of like using what you have there, right? We hear this as a common theme in all the different guests we have on the podcast, all the different people I get to meet out and about in Ciderville. He's now making ice cider and finally got sparkling cider that I really like, which was made with a riddling and disgorging technique. So that's like a champagne method. And he's very eager for knowledge and reading a lot of articles and scientific publications on fermentation, everything else related to cider and wine production. Because my point of view is that the real cider maker has to know and be able to do everything from grafting and planting to bottling and marketing. Wow. (laughs) Right on. I want to make my cider production commercially. Definitely. Now I'm at the scale of only 3,000 liters, limited by the size of my shed. So that's not a huge amount, but you know, I would consider that a nano cidery and that's pretty righteous just alone. But I think I have made my technology stable and predictable, and the only barrier for further growth is legalization, which is a very difficult thing in Russia. Just a few days ago, I planted my own orchard. It is only 430 trees, but there are 57 cider varieties, and I need several years more to to determine which of them are cold-resistant enough and ready to propagate. Another 700 seedlings I started to grow in my nursery this season, and these orchards And these orchard works are a joy for me, actually, with a smiley. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Cheers, Maxim. Maxim, thank you so much for giving us the the lowdown on what's going on in Russia, because I've been very interested about that for quite a while. 
I know that we use a lot of rootstock there. And one of the questions I put out to Maxim was, what is it about the legalization in Russia? So I'm sure he's going to write back. Thanks again, Maxim. Thanks for becoming a patron of Cider Chat. It means the world for me. It really helps keep this podcast going up. And the other patrons that just joined is a couple based out of Tucson headed to Colorado, and that is both Carrie and Matthew. Uh, I met them actually at CiderCon, and Carrie and a friend came out on the Monterey Bay Cider Tour. I was just thrilled and delighted to uh, meet two besties who were doing like a, a girls' fun kind of like weekend out, out in California. And it looks like Carrie and Matthew are going to be starting a cidery, so I'll be following up with them too. And I just want to give you a big cheers and thank you so much for supporting this podcast. Again, like Maxim and all the other patrons, the commercial patrons, such as Ross on Y Cider in the UK, and MR Processing and Cider Analysis out of Connecticut, that's John Edwards, Insider Japan, based in Japan, that's Lou Reed these fantastic commercial makers that are supporting this podcast and not to forget by all means that Luxembourg, actually Luxembourg's only cidery that we know, Ramborn Cider Company. Thank you all for being patrons. You really are helping this podcast stay on air and rolling out each week. Yes, we do like having fun. That's what it's all about. Cider equals fun. What else do I need to say to convince you? I don't think much more if you are in the know. And uh, if you are in the know, that song is being sung by myself and my cousin Jay. We are kind of twins, so we've been uh, singing together forever, it seems, ever since we were little babies in a sandbox, a little sandbox that was essentially a wooden boat that my dad filled with sand because uh, I was what you might call uh, a river rat. We grew up alongside a river, and I probably spent more time in the water than I did on the land. And, of course, what kind of sandbox are you going to have when you're a little kid other than a boat filled with sand? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Good times indeed. Anyways, um, that song, the full length of it will be played at the end of this year podcast, and I hope you enjoy that ditty. And before we head to the main feature, I want to take just a moment to remind you now that now is the time to book your reservations for the Totally Cider Tour to Normandy, France, heading out the last week of September. If you want to bring somebody along who's not like cider fanatic like myself and perhaps you, this is a tour to come along on because it is absolutely filled with plenty of sightseeing and the excitement of learning about cider all in one package. Uh, we begin and end in Paris, France. We're going to have a ton of cider dinners throughout. You have also time to go out and have dinner on your own. We're going to have one night when we head to Mont St. Michel, and that night is going to be kind of stealth because... You go up to Mont St. Michel, which is this very, very old m mount. It was called Mount Tom at one time because it's on an island that gets surrounded by water. So we'll see it's a single wave that comes in and fills this massive span of sand. And we're going to just be sitting pretty on Mont St. Michel, watching it come in, have a cider dinner that night on Mont St. Michel get to just drop and watch the lighting. People come from around the world to just take photographs there. That's just one of the sightseeing trips. There's also Itrat. So if you want to see a little bit about the white cliffs of Itrat, which are world famous, some people consider it the most magnificent uh, view to see on the, on the beaches of France, go to the Cider Chat Facebook page and see the link there that I kind of posted about and how to see it. It's, it's all these arches going into the water. Uh, you might have seen that if you've been on the California coastline or other coastlines, but there's nothing like this particular setting 
in the world. What can I say other than this is kind of like the last call? There are eight seats left for this tour for France, uh, rolling out again the last week of September. Uh, last call ends on May 31st. Go to the Totally Cider page at ciderchat.com. Next up is a pre recorded chat from CiderCon 2019 in Chicago. This was a cider dinner that took place at CiderCon. We didn't go out to dinner that night. I put out to them, you know, why don't we have dinner on site? Bring it in. It'll be a little bit more intimate. We won't have all the background noise. And they were totally game for it. So they picked out the restaurant. They they got the food from a restaurant that does barbecue because, shoot, this is Southern Cider. Why not have a classic barbecue dinner? And we did that. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But mainly, we're just talking about their apple varieties, southern apple varieties, and what they're doing at James Creek Cider House. So I know you're going to really enjoy that. And then just a little bit of an update at CiderCon 2019. David was just elected as a new board member of the United States Cider Association. So if you are just kind of sitting on the fence, well, you know that this guy, who I have a lot of respect for, is now one of the folks at the helm of the association. And I couldn't be more excited both for the association and for he and for his region of America, the South. That needs a little bit of representation, I would think. So for whatever that's worth, put that in your cap and wear it. And Anne-Marie is just equally delightful. In fact, they both are. So I really enjoyed this opportunity to have a sit down with them. Can't wait to see them again, wherever that might be out and about in Ciderville. But meanwhile, let's all grab a glass and join this chat because we are having a sit down dinner. Make sure your cup is full because you're going to get hungry and inspired by the folks behind James Creek Cider House in North Carolina, Anne-Marie and David Thornton. Beautiful. We've got a Calvander. This is a washed rind cheese from Chapel Hill Creamery, very near us. This is a Lindville, um, a hard aged goat cheese. And this one is a Thomasville Tom from the Piedmont in Virginia. So it's kind of the what grows together goes together, sort of. This is the first time on Cider Chat that we've done this type of recording <laughs> for our cider dinner where we are, um, let me just move that up here a little bit. Mm -hmm. We have all the equipment set up. We have a white linen tablecloth, mm -hmm. which is yeah, pretty fancy fancy. And you've brought this food. We've smelled it going down the elevator. We've cup glasses from everywhere. And here we, we are. We are ready. We are <laughs> ready. I'm ready. <laughs> this is truly a southern cider. We use old southern heirloom apples. Our region is 7B. It's warm. Zone 7. Zone 7B. Seven seven yeah. Zone. yeah, yeah. Um, it's warm. It's warmer than it is in New England. Um, mm -hmm. And so our ciders have less acidity, but we have nice tannins. Mm. And so I think you'll see that. So we wanted to, to bring kind of some traditional Southern fare, because we really think Southern fare goes very nicely with cider. Mm. I know a lot of people don't think necessarily about the South and cider. No, I mean, I mean seriously, like, you know, you're in North Carolina. So a lot of cideries that I know of, they're, they're bringing juice in from other areas. So when you say you're in zone 7B? That's correct. What's the elevation that you're in? Oh, and what's we're 100 feet above sea level, <laughs> It depends maybe? on which orchard, but yeah. 100 to 200 feet above okay. sea level. Yeah. Uh, we're in from the coast uh, a couple of hours, but uh, it is, it, it's warm. Uh, the south has a uh, broad diversity of agricultural zones from the mountains, which may even be 5B, all the way down through 8B if you're down in Georgia uh, or Alabama. But apple trees have grown in all those zones. Uh, the same trees may produce fruit of slightly different characteristics, mm -hmm. but one thing is uh, that we have in common is there, there are numerous southern apples 
that have proliferated on all the uh, subsistence farms across the South for hundreds of years uh, that have yet to really be discovered or used. We, uh, you know, we didn't discover these. Uh, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, and then there were people who came before us who really rescued these. Mm -hmm. And active cider makers now, uh, the Shelton's at uh, at uh, Albemarle, mm -hmm. uh, Diane Flint working up in uh, in Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, at Foggy Ridge, uh, have been using these to make cider for a while. Uh, but Lee Calhoun really saved these. Uh, Mr. Calhoun uh, really. Uh, spent uh, spent uh, his life as an avocation collecting old southern apples to preserve them. Yeah, I mean, he started forty years ago, and he wrote this this beautiful book. He did research at like the National Agricultural Center up in Maryland, and like the USDA pomological watercolors, mm -hmm. and he was able to document sixteen hundred southern apples and he was able to get cuttings and graft and preserve 400 apples and so all our early apple trees are from his his yeah. stock and he, he lives like 30 40 minutes from us Whew, so that's a mouthful right there <laughs> i mean just it is think actually. of that boom i mean because the um, the concept of a southern apple is not something that you hear yeah, it sounds like an oxyboron, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, right. It really does. I mean, southern apple. Yeah. Uh, but indeed, uh, actually, people across the south have been growing heirloom apples that are we think of as northern for for as many centuries. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Roxbury russets and Grimes goldens, uh, golden russets. Uh, these have uh, wine saps, are huge. Mm -hmm. uh, these have long been grown on farms in the south, mm -hmm. but many varieties that are much more obscure, like limber twigs. Terry Winters, Yates, uh, Nickajack, Follow Water. Mm -hmm. These are all southern apples. We grow a lot of King David's. Uh, uh, which There's is a joke a, in there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I like my namesake. Uh, but, uh, you know, Arkansas Black. So there are some that are more familiar, mm -hmm. but there are many that are they're fairly obscure. Mm. And, uh, and they're remarkable, quite honestly. They, yeah. they, they can make good cider. Well, shall we taste some of your sure. cider? Yeah, sure. So, so okay, what start. David poured for you is the russets and twigs. Mm -hmm. And the name is a little bit of a joke. This is a semi-dry cider, but it gets its name because we use lots of russeted apples. So American golden russet, Roxbury russet, mm -hmm. keener seedlings, rusty coats. And then we use a lot of apples that have twig in the name. Mm -hmm. So that includes black twigs and about five kinds of limber twigs, royal limber twig, red limber twig, black limber twig. And the limber twig is a really distinctive apple and has kind of a twang to it. <laughs> it does. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Well, it's so a yeah. southern apple. Yeah. <laughs> and, the t and it has a very um, interesting growing habit. It's a it's quite a droopy tree. I mean, that's how it got its name. The, t the, the branches are quite bendy, so they're oh. limber. So the limber twigs sort of droop, and they, they have a... Yeah, like, uh, like weeping willows. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're spur-bearing. It's a, it's a different sort of tree habit. Spur-bearing. Uh, but... Uh, Thorny. Uh, not not quite thorny. Okay. Uh, not not like a rootstock tree or a. But okay. but they're um, they look different than mm. other trees, mm. and they do have that common thread of a of a flavor characteristic. So, mm. russets and twigs, semi dry. Wow! Wow! Yeah, yeah semi dry. Well, cheers. 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 Wow. Mm. This is. A, a cider that we macerated uh, these pre-fermentation for a little bit to, to pull out a little bit more mm -hmm. tannin from them. Mm -hmm. They're not classically bittersweet apples, but they do have a tannic profile. Definitely. Um, and we feel that um, apples like grapes uh, in the warmer climate, we know that they tend to ripen more. So we have higher bricks and higher alcohol in our apples than we might if we got the same apple in the mountains. But like grapes also in the heat, uh, we believe that they tend to um, bring out a little more uh, tannic 
uh, ripeness or mm -hmm. phenolic ripeness. Mm -hmm. And the acidity tends to drop in the heat as well. So especially for the apples that we that we harvest in, in the heat of summer. Well, now that's not these. these in the actually, heat of summer, you're the harvesting of, apples, wow. Absolutely, August, we definitely, we have an early bloom date. So wow. we have apples, yeah. the King David's and, and, and Ripe Golden's come off the trees. Historically, the North Carolina or a Southern apple season is really from June to November. Right. That's why apples were such a huge part of, of the diet of, you know, southern farmers, sub subsistence farmers, because you could harvest apples from June to November, and then you could store them and keep them until May. Mm. So they say, mm. you know, you would have apples at every meal. Uh, during the during the winter when there was not much fresh food, right. you yeah. could store apples, special. and many of the apples in the South had names that would uh, tell you that they they would hang around, like Johnson's Keeper or Terry Winter. Mm -hmm. uh, these were apples that would mm -hmm. that would keep well, uh, yeah. And, yeah, and and they would be hard. Keener seedlings in Arkansas blacks are very hard when you harvest them. You really need to sweat them for mm. a while before you crush them and mm. press them. Mm. Yeah. Uh, they they benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this is primarily a blend of late season apples, except the Roxbury russets, which we, which we pick earlier um, and store and sweat to put them into this russet blend. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's a, a really nice cider. You know, it has this lingering mouth feel, uh, the dry. It has, uh, it has a longer finish. Uh, it has undergone an MLF, so you get mm -hmm. a bit of uh, creaminess to it. Mm -hmm. I, the, I, but it is not bottle conditioned, so, and it mm -hmm. has been pasteurized, so it has a nice mm -hmm. uh, shelf life uh, and some stability. Definitely. So, and let's just clarify, MLF is malolactic fermentation. You want to let folks who don't know anything about MLF, uh, what would be the short descriptor of Malolactic fermentation. Uh, malolactic fermentation is uh, a bacterial fermentation that typically occurs after uh, yeast ferment sugars to to alcohol, uh, and it uh, moves mal uh, malic acid to lactic acid, which effectively decreases the the acidity of the total acidity of the cider. Uh, mm -hmm. It tends to make it a little more softer, and lactic acid has a bit more of a round or creamy texture, so uh, a partial MLF um, can change sort of the mouthfeel of the cider and the, and the, the flavors in the cider. Uh, and they can sometimes elaborate other compounds that add to the, to the mouthfeel in the body. Mm -hmm. That was a brilliant uh, descript description <laughs> of malolactic fermentation. I, are you a teacher by trade? <laughs> Uh, no, not recently. <laughs> oh, that was really darn good. That was spot on there. You know, how did you get into cider? Let's talk about that backstory. Yeah, mostly it was the apples. Hmm. Um, we read about Lee Calhoun, mm -hmm. and we were kind of, we had a farm, mm -hmm. thinking that we would like to, to grow something. Um, thought a little bit about wine, but we don't live in a great region for that. Mm. And... Then we heard about Lee's uh, apples, and we knew about people like Steve Wood and Diane Flint making mm -hmm. great heritage ciders. And we wow. thought, all right, they're doing that for their locales. Wouldn't that be really cool to try to do it for North Carolina apples to produce a cider from, from this place? Ten years ago, we put like 60 old southern apple varieties into the ground, what Dave proudly called our test orchard like <laughs> let's, let's let's see if this is going to work mm. and at the time we thought we were super cool because we really weren't aware of um, southern heirloom producers so we, oh, we thought I, I thought these apples must make great cider because we knew there was a cider culture hundreds of years ago when these apples were growing so we thought they must make great cider we're going to be super cool we're going to plant these and then of course as we were after they were in the ground we were doing research we realized all oh, these people had planted these apples already <laughs> and uh, we just weren't quite aware of it uh, but all the better because uh, regionally people uh, regionally yeah, yeah, yeah especially right. at Albemarle vintage Virginia yeah, 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 uh, yeah. but Diane Flint had a number of these on her farm and, and we weren't quite aware of that when we when we threw these into the ground oh. yeah not no nine all right uh, so it, it, you know it was it was fun to discover and quite honestly we, we learned quite a bit exploring these things uh, together so it's a it's a lot of fun in the south we, we have yet quite to discover 
our, our cider heritage, or, or at least rediscover it. Yeah. Uh, so we're kind of pumped up about that idea that yeah. more people might plant these, okay. uh, and that these trees might co-locate over to other parts of the country where there are warm climates, but people might like to plant them. But many of these apples are great dual-use apples. They can make a lovely cider, but they can also be sold fresh. Uh, so for our farm, it, it's ideal. Well, the rule is the pretty apples go to market. They have to. Uh, but, yeah, they have to. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. there are certain varieties that we do save for cider. You know yeah. what's really cool about it is that you're not saying, oh, you know, we have to bring in ciders from some other, you know, region of the world because that's what folks are doing. You're looking at what had been done in your own region and embracing your local delightful varieties that are there. I mean, that that is exactly what, you know, being up at the cider share, you know, and having the Japanese ciders, you know, they're using the apples that are there. They're not, right. they're planting some of these other ones, but let's see what these apples do. Oh, we're, we're planting other apples too. I, I haven't met an apple that I don't want to put in the ground. <laughs> uh, but we're not harvesting many yet. No. But we have uh, some, we have some English and we have some French and, mm-hmm. and we also have some Spanish now. Well, we live in an area called the, the Sand Hills or kind of locally people call it the land of the pines. And so we, our farm is surrounded by tall, um, 60, 70 foot long leaf pine trees with big long pine needles mm-hmm. on them, the kind they use for landscaping mm-hmm. near, near us. And big pine cones. Big pine, and big big pine cones. cones and giant wow. pine cones too. Wow. Um, and so the orchard at, at home is sloped down a hill above the James Creek that we mm-hmm. named the farm for, mm-hmm. uh, and it's surrounded by great big pine trees, which shelters it nicely. Mm. And the pines make a beautiful sound in the wind. Um, it sounds a little like the ocean for in a seashell or from a distance. Mm-hmm. So it has a it has its own sound. So there, you have a forest mm-hmm. canopy that's around you, and and then uh, an orchard at our house full of apple trees um, of various varieties. And then we have a second orchard uh, about 15 minutes north, where we grow peaches and a, a variety of other fruit. Uh, and that's where we have really our commercial endeavors. Um, the, mm-hmm. the orchard at home is our test orchard and cider mm-hmm. orchard. Um, and then the cider house is at the north orchard. Okay. And are you using all your own apples then? Or are you, you bringing some apples in from the region? Oh. We use primarily our own apples for the James Creek label. Mm-hmm. So when we started this adventure, you know, we wanted to make apples mm-hmm. from our southern mm-hmm. heirloom apples. Um, but man, yeah, those trees grow really slowly. Right? <laughs> you know, so well, we were patient, but then we were kind of ready to begin. And and really, it was partly coming to CiderCon that had us thinking about mm. modern ciders mm. and and other options. Mm. You know, we'd come here and there'd be cider makers and they were getting juice in and they were, they were, you know, fermenting all spring and I was like, yeah. we've crushed our apple. <laughs> we have yeah. to wait. Right. We have to yeah. wait all year. Yeah, we, cru- we crushed both our apples then. <laughs> the, uh, it- but, um, <laughs> so, and, you know, I was going to a lot of uh, courses offered by the NC State Extension Office and and meeting a bunch of growers, meeting fifth generation apple growers, some mm-hmm. of them, you know, growing limber twigs and stamens and, and cool things. And I thought, you know, we're actually, we're making pretty good cider. Mm-hmm. I think that we could try to make good cider from more modern apples and, and let's give it a try. Mm-hmm. So we did. And our, our local but, farmers. But... In the process, we decided that we would create a separate label. So James Creek is all our heritage ciders. Mm-hmm. And Stargazer, that's named for the, for the night skies on the farm, mm-hmm. is our modern label. And so we do modern ciders, we do a bunch of barrel-aged ciders, and we do a lot of fruit ciders, fruit seasonal, where we blend the ciders with other fruits. We're in an area with very dark skies, and uh, the night sky is a treasure to us, you know, at the end of a day. Um, so we, stargazer just matched with what we do. Um, and we called it cider with a sense of place because you, you could navigate by the stars, and you would know where you were. And, and so we really want wow. our ciders to be local. So we like to use local apples, local farms. 
mm-hmm. and then our own fresh produce. So we make we love to make you know fruit ciders, uh, and we love to make you know hop ciders and stuff. We really try to source our ingredients locally, mm-hmm. and, so and keep it only apple and is, only fresh. Mm-hmm. It's all North Carolina. It's all like a hundred, hundred and twenty-five miles from our farm. Mm-hmm. No problem with that. Yeah. So you poured two ciders already. Yeah, we want to try this guy. Well, we had the russet and twigs. What is this one here? So this is uh, Harvest Moon. Harvest Moon. Uh, this is another uh, heirloom southern uh, cider. Mm-hmm. Uh, it also has some tannins. It's dry. It's a dry mm-hmm. cider. Uh, this is our mid-season uh, cider. And we we decided that we would like to mm-hmm. make ciders from apples that uh, ripen together because we kind of fancied that that was probably what happened a hundred or, or a couple hundred years ago. Ciders came off the tree, or apples mm-hmm. came off the tree. Yep. They would need to make cider to preserve them. Uh, and so we lumped them into summer, which is summer gold, harvest moon, which is our September, October, and then russets and twigs, which is October, November. And, uh, and so these are the apples that sort of came off the tree together, and we found that if we blended them together, uh, we could make some fun ciders with them. This cider is a, a dry cider. It, the tannins in the apples match the, I think, match the dryness in the, with the acidity, so we hope mm-hmm. that it's a well-balanced cider. And, uh, and it's fun to throw Canard's Choice, Stamen wine saps, Virginia wine saps, uh, some local crabs, uh, other uh, black, black twigs black go twigs. in here sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so it's fun to throw uh, different apples together uh, to make this work. It goes fantastic with the cheese. <laughs> I really made it. Like both of them just mm-hmm. pop perfectly. Thanks. And uh, so I'm, I really thank you for bringing oh, that cheese. Oh, it's our pleasure. Yeah, really, like, boom, immediately. All right, so we have the Harvest Moon, and we have the Russets and Twigs, and these are, uh, the Russets and Twig is a 8%, the uh, Harvest Moon is a 7.5, and this is a little bit less of a ABV here, 6.5. This is. These, many of the apples that we source for our Stargazer line uh, are from up in the mountains, uh, and this has, uh, this is called Seven Sisters after the Pleiades, and uh, it has uh, blackberries and raspberries, and we fancy tossing other berries into here also as they are available. Um, and so this is, we, we try to craft a balanced cider with a nice berry fa- flavor uh, that's all fresh uh, mm-hmm. and uh, represents sort of the area that we're growing in. Since many of these apples come from the mountains, they have a different profile. They're, they just don't have as high an ABV, and we don't chapitalize any of these. It's just that where we grow, things get sweet Mm -hmm. and we harvest uh, huge crabs that are 22 bricks sometimes Mm -hmm. Uh, golden russets can get to be 19 or 20 bricks in our climate yeah Yeah. we even had galas at 16 (laughs) last year when there was no rain yeah we had a hot dry (laughs) summer and the the galas were 16 bricks. they were delicious Uh, they were crisp and they were sweet like mad wow so uh, a totally different type of apple uh, so this is a berry cider, and we thought it might complement the barbecue, too. Seven Sisters Blackberry Cider with oh. cane fruits, and the cane fruit being the blackberry. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, what they was saying about chapelization is they're, they're not, that's a word in cider making uh, where you one would add sugar to it. So they're not adding sugar That's to it. That's correct. Right. We don't add, add any sugar. Chapelization is adding sugar before fermentation right. to right. raise ABV. Yeah. No. No need to do that. Right. And we, we don't add sugar after fermentation either. Mmm. Mm. Oh. North Carolina blackberries. So, yes, yeah, Stargazer, just the, the label in the sense that we see, so uh, this has the Pleiades on it, but often uh, the, the constellation on the label reflects what is in our sky when we harvest the fruit that goes in the cider. So, so our flagship Stargazer cider is Mighty Hunter, which is Orion, the Mighty Hunter, who rises in the fall. So the Mighty Hunter strides up out of the east horizon in the evenings during the fall. For, for, Gem, for the twins, we call the Gemini, uh, is, uh, is Strawberry and Rhubarb Cider, which is the springtime, and the Gem- Gemini are uh, prominently in the springtime. Mm-hmm. That's the first mm-hmm. constellation you'll see in the West mm-hmm. as it's setting in the spring. So Leo comes with the peaches in the heat of the summer. Leo is big in our southern sky. So, uh, you know, it's fun to watch the stars wheel over, and, and for us it's, uh, it's a meaningful thing as, as we stretch our farming season. We could never harvest all one crop all in two weeks mm-hmm. on, tw- on 20 acres of land that we work. So we try to build our small farm 
so that it has a rolling harvest of different produce as the season rolls along. Mm. So mm. it's meaningful to us. As, as I agree mm -hmm. with you. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I feel that there's there's some depth here, and I don't feel I, I'm not sure I've really understood. Like, where's this coming from? What's your background? Where, you know, <laughs> who are you? I I'm a physician. I I, oh, okay. uh, I I do pulmonary critical care medicine. No uh, kidding. And, wow. And I love it. I, I love yeah. my job. I, I'm a prior military, I'm a veteran, and, I, and it's nice to settle down in a place and not have to pack heat to work. And, uh, well, you got a lot of job. heart, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of work you're doing yeah. medically. Yeah. You're in the heartbeat of the cider. You can feel that, no yeah. doubt. I mean, the, that, the, the farm is my right. is our respite. Is my yeah. respite. Now, it, it's Anne Reese's full time job. So yeah. mm. but, but, but Dave also grew up in Ohio, in Cincinnati, and his family is long time in the produce business in Cincinnati. No so he really grew grew up, you know, as a, as a teenager. Loading, unloading skids. Right. Mm. I grew up driving a forklift and a dolly and pulling produce off trucks, putting it on other trucks. And, mm -hmm. and I loved it, and I always uh, wished I uh, was on a farm, uh, you know, because of the oh, stuff. Yeah. 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 So, so he called it and it came. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and he yeah. recognized some of these old cider varieties. He's like, Lumber Twig, do you remember Lumber Twig? <laughs> I'd say, we used to no, receive those I don't from remember Lumber Twig. From small no, growers really. and, wow. and move them out to the market. I, I hadn't heard of these varieties, and I can't say that I'm an expert on apples by any means. I mean, really, Cider Chat is my my classroom in that yeah. way. Um, but, you know, <laughs> there's a, a I don't know. It, there's something about you, both of you, that I, I want the folks listening <laughs> to like get that there's a softness, that eloquence, and you're really noticing the world. You're not just in James Creek right there. You're in James Creek and you're looking to the sky. And that is what the craft of cider making is, you know, to really bring in all these elements and not just say, okay, we're going to make cider, we're going to make it this way, but we're going to get informed by the Greek, mm -hmm. we're going to get informed by these pines, we're going to get informed by the seasonality of the, or, or just the, the yeah, the, the different stars that are going yeah. up there. I mean, not everybody looks at it this way, so yeah. you brought on these, like, well, different know, dimensions. It's, for us, it's probably it's in part because where we live is, is not where we grew up. Mm -hmm. you know, so I was I was born in Manhattan and I grew up in a little suburb of of New York, and oh. then um, before we moved to North Carolina, we spent ten years in San Antonio um, when Dave was in the Air Force, mm. and uh, well, we heard about uh, the hospital where where he's associated with is in is in Pinehurst, mm. and he came out for the interview and he came out and then I flew to join him. And it, this was like the very end of August, the beginning, very beginning of September. And it was a long, hot, dry summer <laughs> in San Antonio. And I was, you know, reading and doing my thing on the plane. And we started our descent. And I, I looked out the window, and there were all these beautiful, lush pine trees. Oh. And it just, it just completely took my breath away. Wow. I mean, it was just, it was just such this moment, mm. and I felt like, like you oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. 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 You, think, wow. you know, and I hadn't necessarily been thinking that this was the place that we would end up, but when I had that feeling, I was like, oh, all right, you know, that's, mm. that's telling you something, and we, and we moved there when we were in San Antonio, we had an awesome house in an awesome neighborhood, but mm -hmm. we were... You know, kind of downtown, mm -hmm. a little urban, a little, a little, oh, yeah. a little, a little gritty. Yeah. And then, you know, we found this farm. It was beautiful and moved out there. And, and I think From we... From San Antonio, yes. moved out to... Is it, is it called James Creek, the farm? Uh, no. yeah, our farm is, yeah, James yeah. Creek Richards. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, but we, it, wasn't that, it wasn't that when we bought it. It was oh. just a, a piece of land yeah. with pine yeah. trees. Yeah, so, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, because that's a big switch. I mean, you know, Ohio, New York, North Carolina. Right. So how long have you been down there? Yeah, since O two. 2 Since so, 2 So going so, on yeah. 17, wow. 17 right. years. Wow. Yeah, yeah, but I think we just had such a deep appreciation of how lucky we were to be in such a beautiful place and just to really soak it in. Right. 
then not taking for granted. Yeah. 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 Think, to yeah. appreciate, you know, after being in San Antonio, it's, uh, it doesn't have four seasons the way, you know, someone from up north would think of uh, Ohio yeah, or, 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 New, or New York. Oh, we <laughs> love San Antonio. <laughs> our, our palates will never be the same. Oh, we adore great. Mexican food. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's I mean, that, that's, that's a part of us in a big way. But uh-huh. But yeah, I think it was that uh, switch and, and moving to the farm and just okay. you know, getting into and the that rhythm. That reveals it. That reveals everything. it. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, for myself and I know folks who listen to Cider Chat, we want to know, like, what is informing you? And this tells <laughs> us a bit, you know, um, because that is going to then inform the product that you make. And um, how lucky is North Carolina to have you that way to really appreciate <laughs> what's going on. I think it's more that we're lucky to be there and lucky to yes. be in the community we're in. You, yeah. you, you talk about your classroom here. I, we yeah. feel very much that way on the farm. Uh-huh. The, the, the farmers that we know, the orchards that we know around us, and the orchard is not, not too far away, uh, help us all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the cider makers uh, and the cider mm-hmm. con, it, it can be a very collaborative community. Right. I mean, really fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about the location where you were in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. North Carolina is a really long uh, east to west state. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. So, so what, what, what side? We are kind North of Carolina? on the middle. We're at Eastern Barbecue. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to barbecue. start with a twang, you know, this is what happens when Careful you now. on the south. Careful. But, uh, well, look, I've worked in Louisiana and they tolerated me. I'd be like, oh lordy, you know, and they, yeah. you know, not that I, I could even pretend I'm from there, but, um, uh, yeah, we're about 50 minutes south of Chapel Hill. Okay. Yeah. And maybe two, two and a half hours northeast of Charlotte. Okay. So we're there kind of on the border of the Piedmont and the Sand Hills. Beautiful. In the okay. Pines. Beautiful. Wow. And, and we are lucky to be there. The, uh, the Carborough Farmer's Market is where uh, Emory runs, really runs yeah. our farm. Carborough is a tiny little town right next to Chapel Hill, mm-hmm. and, where and University in North Carolina is. Very okay. close to Durham and Raleigh. Okay. And, uh, okay. and it's, a, it's a wonderful farmer's market full mm, of, full of awesome, awesome producers. And mm-hmm. with a very year round. Uh, year round mm-hmm. and in its 41st year. Yeah. Wow. 41st year. Yeah. With a really strong That's emphasis fantastic. on organics and wow. sustainability. And yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. That's it's, crazy. Making. And has been a great venue for us uh, to, to sell our cider and our fresh produce. Mm-hmm. Uh, great people shopping. And uh, it's just a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Amory can tell you more than that. Yeah. Uh, it's a lovely community. Yeah. It, it really is. Yeah. I can only imagine. Uh, I've spent a little bit of time through North Carolina, and um, I, I think for for cider share, this is the first North Carolina um, cidery since uh, Noble Cider we had mm-hmm. Trevor, on last year. Trevor Baker. And um, yeah, it's Trevor Baker. And um, when I think of North Carolina, I do think of farming quite a mm-hmm. bit. Um, people yeah, really, it's a very you know, state. really, yeah, really ingrained into the society. And I don't know if folks really know that about that region. Right. Uh, so, this well, is what we do. We're sort of bully, bullish on the south, on the southern region. We have a lot of great cider makers that are uh, making some wonderful and varied ciders. We have some very large producers. We mm-hmm. have some very small producers. We have some uh, producers that are making sort of off the off the path ciders that are very interesting. Uh, we have some mainstream uh, producers also. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know whether they're growing their own or whether they're getting their juice, they're, they're making ciders mm-hmm. that, that are worth being proud of. Is there any association in North Carolina? Yeah, we're working mm-hmm. on it. Yeah, working okay. on it. Yeah. So do you have an idea of the number of cideries in North Carolina? I think it's about 15. 15? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's getting up there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's re- looking really good. Not, not everybody's a member of the USACM yet, but right. uh, but you know, I, I think it's quite worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, North Carolina is like seventh in the U.S. in apple production. But there are a lot of apples no in North kidding. Carolina. Yeah. No kidding. And yeah. is that one particular region in North Carolina? It's primarily in the Blue Ridge Mountains. In the Blue Ridge like Mountains. Asheville, mm-hmm. Hendersonville. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. The chill hours and stuff. And um, where you are... You, you get snow, right? We do. You do? So you have, a, obviously, you have enough chill hours. How many chill hours do we have already? A thousand. Oh, yeah. Maybe 1,100. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I haven't I haven't looked in a while. The the apples we have no issues with chill hours and apples. That seems no. to be just fine. Yeah. But it's a it's a critical issue with peaches. And mm -hmm. so I watch the chill hours for the peaches. Mm -hmm. And we went over a thousand in the, my tree that needs the most. Mm. Or peaches. We have that some that are like six fifty, seven hundred, eight hundred, but the most is like a thousand, a thousand fifty, so so what are you doing with the peaches and cider? Oh, we do I have a peach cider. Well, I don't know that we brought one I don't down. Think we brought, I don't think we we'll brought one, we'll sneak one, one to down, yeah. but peach cider is fun. It's one that we're known for because we're peach growers. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, we'd um, crush them and press them and just um, add the juice for sweetness into a cider. And it's uh, well, well, let me back up and get that again. So you crush and press the peaches. The peaches mm -hmm. and capture those, the juice and, the, and just add the fresh juice to the cider. We're not uh, fermenting. fermenting. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. For, for, for our peach, we, we don't ferment the, the fresh juice of the peach. Oh, okay. uh, but we, we choose to blend uh, ciders to offset the acidity of the peaches sometimes. So we, mm. adjust, uh, we adjust our cider blends with every batch we do. Mm -hmm. And we don't mm -hmm. make a cider that Amory and I don't enjoy together mm -hmm. uh, that we don't make together uh, so yeah. Oh, oh this is worth oh, trying. We didn't bring the straight awesome. peach. Yeah, we didn't we bring straight peach. Prowling peach. Okay. But so we brought this one flare. that we made for the first time. Pop that. Bourbon um, barrel aged cider with peach. Yeah. Okay, is this a southern cider? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need a glass. Yeah, 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 we'll get a glass. Oh, no, yeah. big one. Uh, big, oh, yeah, yeah. This is worth a big glass. Okay. Try that. Yeah. So, so last we, year we had a really fun bourbon barrel cider, and this year we just decided to. Mix it oh, up. Can you just put that up there again? Yeah, just it. a second uh -huh. for a second. Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. <laughs> I, I gotta open it first. Yeah, I know. Oh, I know. Gosh, yeah. I'm catching up here, multitasking. All right, good deal. One more time. There we go. Perfect. Here you are. Ooh. Try that. Look at that. Ooh. Here, Dave, I can tell already. Just you. looking at the glass. Sometimes the glass is so. Because there were times where. Oh, you felt like you could just taste peach fuzz, and then you would get get fruit and yeah. Wow. Okay. I, so I would just want to take a pause here, because I'm having one of those moments that I had when I had the um, persimmon cider that <laughs> was made by Soquel Cider, and you know you have the orchard with the apples and the persimmon right there. Well, he. This is why I've been you know wondering because. I had in my mind that you had a peach cider, and I don't know if you poured this when I first met you, but well, this is a perfect match because you are peach farmers and you have the the apples too, and this is a very exciting cider. Like, mm. yeah, I think one thing that's particularly distinctive about mm. it is when you taste it, you you know how authentically yeah. peachy it is, and yeah. so many. Foods wow. that say they have have peach have kind of a you know candy peach taste to them, but this is very peach biting yeah. into peach. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do is pull a peach off the tree in the in the heat of the summer, especially when you're good and sweaty, and, yeah. and just chomp into yeah. it. Yeah, uh, and the it, juice is just running outside mm -hmm. your mouth because it's so juicy. Yeah. You have to be ready though because real peaches are fuzzy. Peaches. Really fuzzy. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. But imagine if it's really ripe, the the skin comes off a little bit easier. Uh, just bite right say? into it. You just bite into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have made peach cider, where I fermented it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. It's very hard for it to clear. Mm -hmm. And you know, with this cider here, this this has a haze to it. it yes, does. it does. And it that is a peach. Yes. Mm -hmm. The peach does that. Right. I mean, it's to, you. I would, I I would be very weary to drink a peach cider that was total crystal clear. I, I'm I'm it, sure it can be done, but for why? us, why? I think yeah, you pull something out of I, it. I always fear that we could filter the soul right out of yeah. a good beverage, yeah. uh, and not not that that's always done, but I worry it for about it for our own skill set. I prefer. We prefer generally. We just don't filter. Yeah. I uh, and uh, mm. and we don't want to oh, find yeah. the, the this. It's got a little pectin haze, and yeah. we're okay with that. Oh, this and like the bourbon barrel. Yeah. It's kind of caramely. Yeah, it's got a, a mm -hmm. nice little Get vanilla a little coconut. Spice. Yeah, right. Yeah, coconut. Right. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, 
That's I was it's like a, that. It's mm. a funny one of those barrel characteristics. It makes me salivating, yeah. right. you know, I'm like salivating, which is perfect for a cider drink because I just want to keep on drinking more. Because <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, it's salivating. Got to wash that down. Like, oh. <laughs> that is uh, top down cider. Wow. Well, it's a fun cider to make. I, yeah. I mean, it really is. And again, it, it's uh, if when you come down and see us, you'll you'll feel the the sand. You'll see I the sand hills, mm-hmm. and uh, and you'll realize that that sandy soil is great for growing peaches. Mm. And I uh, and uh, I wouldn't wish our summers on anybody who's not used to them. But uh, mm-hmm. ooh, a fresh peach in the summer is really nice. Mm-hmm. Now, so you have the cider in a bourbon barrel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how long would it be in that barrel for typically? Mm, up to nine months. Mm-hmm. Up to nine months. Um, tapping off the barrel, tapping off Absolutely. the barrel, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, of course, because otherwise it'd be smelling and tasting really differently. Uh, you pull it off of that, then you add the juice, and um, good to go. I mean, the, the, the bourbon barrel really gives it a dimension that you wouldn't normally think with peach. But I suppose if I had one of your magnificent peaches, and a little bottle of bourbon. <laughs> I might even pour it out <laughs> with a little bit of malted vanilla ice cream. That, that's, that's been known to happen. Oh, I, I <laughs> that, see t- it. that type of mischief yeah. has been known to happen. Yeah, this is a really nice label too. Um, yeah, Thank this you. Uh, you know horizontal, almost like a bark. Yeah, like barrel staves. Mm-hmm. Barrels, yeah, barrel staves, yeah. Really, really nice. And Sol- Solar Flare is the name. Uh, just uh, you know, we were searching for a for a, an, a, an appropriate what would be cosmic name <laughs> for for something that comes up in the heat of the summer. Yeah. So, uh, solar, solar Flare is the way yeah. we went. Yeah, this pops, and it's interesting because it's I'm going to say only six point nine percent. That's correct. You know, which is in my mind, it's not a really high no. um, ABV by any chance. Um, it doesn't taste, it's not going to overwhelm you. And a bourbon barrel aged cider could be much higher. Yes. Yeah. This yeah. isn't. Yeah. Uh, we, we like the subtlety of, uh, of the oak and, and mm. a little less bur- bourbon forward on this mm. uh, f- yeah. to balance with the apples and with the peaches. We still want the Beautiful. fruit to come through. Mm-hmm. Um, and we feel that way about the, the straight peach, the, the uh, hard cider with peach that we make that's not bur- bourbon mm-hmm. barrel aged. We really want our, uh, our cu- customers to appreciate that there's, an a- uh, there's a hard apple cider mm-hmm. in there that's fresh mm-hmm. uh, in addition to the peach. Yeah. So, yeah. And just saying, cider with a sense of place. Yeah. 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 these folks just the super cool people i love how they have integrated the celestial sky onto their labels onto their branding that's pretty neat you just could tell they are full on into north carolina their connection with lee calhoun i mean this guy is an american treasure no doubt and now getting more involved with the association i really I really think that that's another sign of a cider going up. Look for all their contact and info at the show notes for this here episode 179. This month, I am posting a chat with Susanna and James Forbes of A Little Pomona. Susanna Forbes wrote The Cider Insider, and that book is going to be released into the U.S. market on May 21st. In the meanwhile, if you want to follow both Susanna at Drink Britain and this here podcast at Cider Chat, which are, by the way, both of our Twitter feeds, then when the podcast goes live and you retweet that episode, it will then put you into the running or what I'd like to say the hat, because I think she's going to just be pulling a name out of the hat for a free copy of this book, which is covering 
a hundred of the world's best ciders. Not that there aren't more, so don't feel sad if your cider isn't mentioned. Uh, it's a good companion because she covers a hundred ciders, but then says, well, let, let's say you like this cider. Why not try that cider? So she's actually covering even more than a hundred ciders. It's really worth it. She's a fantastic writer. Stay tuned for that. Again, follow at Cider Chat and at Drink Britain on Twitter. And the second part of your homework this week, Ciderville, is to book your reservation now for the Totally Cider Tour headed to Normandy, France in September. Go to the Totally Cider page at ciderchat.com. Going up, going up. Wait for the full song of We Like Cider at the end of this here episode. In the meanwhile, this is Rhea Windcaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. We like cider. We like palms. We love orchards. And have it for the season. There is a reason why we do it like this. Yes, there is. Chasing in the street, smelling all the blossoms, kicking out my feet.